Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Spending and Demand for Government and Military Panel. Um, my name is Anne Baron Di Camillo. I am the uh, CTO for Strategic Cyber Ventures. Um, is everything all right? With the, can you guys hear me? Okay, just making sure there's not too much reverb or anything. Um, uh, I used to be the director for US CERT. I believe Suzanne and uh, Phyllis briefly mentioned that. I, I miss those remarks, but I'm enjoying my new role. Um, today we're going to speak again about government and military spending and demand. We have a great panel here today. Um, I thought I'd start with some statistics just to kind of get us started. Uh, cybersecurity, uh, well, within the cybersecurity space specifically, um, it's reported there are about 6.5 million uh, internet, or, sorry, 6.5 billion internet connected devices. And by 2020, that number is expected to grow to up to 20 billion internet connected devices. Um, you know, inherently, they will have some vulnerabilities associated with the things we heard about on the previous panel, um, all that love that is being connected to the internet, and there's going to be some concerns around that. Um, I think from the government perspective, uh, some of these government institutions are grappling with the complexity of trying to adopt Internet of Things, trying to um, get into the cloud. And so I wanted us to get into uh, the, the complexity associated with this increased growth of devices, associated with um, the traditional bounds of networks and how they're being pushed out as they pursue uh, digital transformation within their organization. So as you can imagine, um, all of these changes come with a price specifically to cybersecurity. So I think the panel today is going to have a, a great opportunity to talk about some of the cybersecurity prices that organizations, government, military, and others are going to be paying associated with these transitions. Um, so with all that good news, um, I'm excited to moderate this panel. Um, and I thought as part of the introduction each of the panelists could do is share successful case studies or best practices that you've seen um, within cyber technology products that are in use or adopted. Uh, within a government and military organization. Um, I thought this would be a great way to give a brief introduction about yourself as well as some you know, best strategies that we can talk about uh, to get us kicked off. So with that, I will turn it over to Greg. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Greg Boyce, and I lead the Homeland Security and Cybersecurity .gov practice for Lockheed Martin. And thinking through some best practices in the procurement of solutions and products and services, one thing I've found is that there's much more of an emphasis on collaboration in outputs and collaboration on metrics mm -hmm. to get to the right endpoint of some of the government enterprises that are transitioning from perhaps a traditional security operations center approach to a security intelligence center approach. And you are seeing a bifurcation in the product specific vehicles like CDM is I think is a good example of looking at the the quick acquisition of products, but then having on the higher end uh, perhaps a down select associated with corporate experience and past performance for some of the marquee, more challenging cybersecurity programs. So I think that's a positive step in thinking through what's the procurement vehicle that makes the most sense for this solution or product or service that's being acquired. You know, I think it gets to another concept I'd like to get into is the whole legacy um, that we're seeing within government organizations and how they can approach modernization of that through programs like CDM. So great example, Greg. Thank you. I'm Rob. Good afternoon. I am Rob Kanaki. I'm a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and I was the director for cybersecurity policy at the National Security Council at the White House. So I, I don't want to pick a fight with Greg, but I may just, just to be <laughs> We like fights. It's I, you know, I, I <laughs> think one of the more interesting companies that's emerged in this space, uh, it's not necessarily about their technology, but it's what they've been able to do within the federal procurement environment. And I'll call out Palantir here, right? There's a lot of debate how good or how bad is Palantir at cybersecurity. What they've been really good at from their beginning is being an independent operator in the federal space. They've been able to go in from the beginning and sell to federal agencies directly. Most of the big players in the field, though they have some great technology at companies like Lockheed, what they're really good at is navigating the system, right? Their skill set is being able to get on federal contracts not to improve federal cybersecurity. And so right now we have this problem where there's great technology, and a lot of the technology comes out of the government. It comes out of research and development, but it can't get sold to the federal government because small companies simply cannot navigate the wickets that are set up for federal procurement. So I think it's a good discussion to have, and I think those challenges are true, small or large. I mean, I am constantly, on a you know, daily, weekly basis, engaged on 
conversation around a good technology that we have to offer and not knowing how to procure it. And the appetite for small uh, pilot programs and the ease of doing that in the government is very, very challenging. And then I think on top of that, you've got labor categories and rate tables that are baked around the wrong criteria, right? It's years of experience. In some cases, it's certifications, not necessarily um, the 20-year-old that, that with the high school education that's going to be the best person in that uh, domain. So I would agree with you. And I think the problems are true for, for large and small. Thank you very much. Um, Mike. Let's Thank go. you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Mike Steed, the founder and uh, managing partner of the Paladin Capital Group. Paladin Capital Group was founded in, in, uh, in 2001. In 2001, we did our first cyber deal. We have done 41 cyber deals since 2001. Um, we have put together um, uh, a group of people to do transactions and deals over the last 14 years, which are second to none. Lots of them come out of the government, come out of the NSA, come out of the kind of the CIA, come out of the uh, come out of the White House. Uh, we have people of specialized competence that come out of those areas. Um, and as much as the government is an important acquirer of technologies and consumer of technologies, I want you to think about where our focus has been. Our focus has been on critical infrastructure, the 16 verticals of critical infrastructure which if one of them goes down, the rest goes down. And I want you to think about who owns the critical infrastructure. The government does not own the critical infrastructure. So as much as the government will be able to maybe test new technologies or bring new technologies to the table, the government doesn't provide the solutions. Mm -hmm. It's got to be private investment into companies that go into the private sector to protect the critical infrastructure. So while the government has defense-grade cyber protections, and they do have that, where we look is we look for those transactions that will allow those defense-grade types of solutions to then be adopted into the commercial side. Can it be commercialized? Is there ease of use? Is it less costly? What are the things that need to be done? So, so, so yes, you want the government to, to, to prove out some technologies, but at the end of the day, it's got to be the private sector that purchases these technologies, enables them, makes them work, monitors them, and then makes sure that the security is in place to do it. So, so that's where we have looked. That's where, our, that's where our focus has been. Lots of work with the government. We have six, seven people with top security clearances that go into the government to look where the spend is going. Um, offices in Silicon Valley, New York, and in, and, in, and in London to be able to find those engines of innovation that are going to make a difference in some of the target theses and areas that we, are, that we are putting money into. And to what comments I think the gentleman made earlier, you don't need to go to Silicon Valley. The number one investor in cybersecurity startups is in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. So that is a great segue um, into my follow-up question. Um, so product acquisition alignment between the public sector and the private sector. Um, from the perspective of the rest of the panel, I think, Mike, you got us started on that. Um, how do you see IT products and acquisition being affected in the development market paths towards um, you know, both the public and private sector? Where do you see those, those alignments? And um, as you see alignments, does it help companies break into the government market? So, so the, we, you know, we work with that. We have a team of value-add people that do that, that help uh, uh, work, work through that. Uh, we have a, uh, a sister company called, called Good Harbor uh, that's headed up by Richard Clark. I think Amelia is here, who's the president of it, um, <laughs> that does that kind of work for our portfolio companies and, and, and really does a very good job of it. Um, what, uh, uh, you know, the government plays an extraordinarily important role because they'll set some standards but remember, those standards are not standards which are mandatory. Um, you're going to see more and more mandatory standards coming on. And it's not K Street that stopped it. It was H Street, which was, the, which was the Chamber of Commerce, that stopped a lot of the standards being adopted uh, because companies did not, did not want that. They wanted to have some kind of a non-mandatory voluntary set of standards. So, so, so as companies begin to take a look at the government, what they're looking for is they're looking to get that good housekeeping stamp of approval. Uh, um, and that is what is driving sales on the commercial side. 
Yeah, because you have that initial customer that's government that gives you that credibility as a as a vendor product. Is that yeah? Kind that's of right. That's right. If you're if you're going to go out to a commercial company with a product, it's got to be vetted. If you've got something vetted inside of the government, it's been adopted by the NSA, U.S. Cyber, whoever it might be. Right. Then, then when you go out to talk to the private companies about adopting this, and understand the private companies today have to spend unlimited amounts of money to acquire these technologies. Mm -hmm. They have to spend that in order to survive. I guess the follow-up question to that, and I definitely want to open it up to the other panelists as well, is that you know, in, uh, getting the, your product vetted by a, a customer like a, you know, let's say DHS or an FBI is you know, a, a gold star. But a lot of a small startup companies can't afford the cycle of acquisition and that it takes to get into government. How do you align, um, where do you see those alignments happening, and, and you know, how do you, uh, you know, suggest that there's, there's an opportunity uh, to get into that market path for small startup companies? For, from my perspective, it's the nature of the product will dictate where you can find that first, you know, customer zero, customer one. Um, there's certain products we've developed, for example, a email phishing training or a very lightweight knowledge management system to allow for uh, security analysts to record their information through incident response or through general uh, security operations center work and then codify it and keep it in a, in a lightweight searchable system so that you can keep accessing that. Those technologies have had greater uh, success in the early stages in the commercial industry. Then we've got some advanced sensors where the tar customer zero, customer one was in the federal sector. So I think the, the key as an investor, as an entrepreneur is to say, where are you going to learn how to improve your product and how it's really used in the trenches? And that's going to depend on the product to find that first customer. I would just add to that, I, I see in a lot of cases the federal market and the private market as almost being divergent. There's such a risk aversion in the federal government, often to its, to its detriment. And so when you look at things like the emergence of new players that are doing big data analytics, they're all doing it in the cloud. That's the only place they can afford to do it. And the federal government is terrified of the cloud. I mean. If you go back to 2010, there was a major effort. It was called uh, Cloud First, right? The idea was if you could put it in the cloud, the federal government said, put it in the cloud if you were a federal agency. Mm -hmm. And they also launched this data center consolidation effort. The idea was shut down data centers, put data in the cloud. That was the theory. CIOs basically refused to do it within the federal government. And so you ironically had a situation in which while the government was saying policy is shrink data centers, move to cloud, the actual number of data centers in the federal government that the federal government ran grew over the last six years. And so that's a major problem. Now I think what we've seen with all these hacks on federal agencies is they're realizing that those legacy data centers were really, really insecure. And where are we back to? Hey, cloud first. So we may see an ability for these to come together in the cloud, but right now there's still such risk aversion and the CIOs trust their old legacy infrastructure even when they shouldn't. Um, great point. I think DHS today just stated that about 60% of the government and military um, spend is actually on supporting IT legacy systems. Um, so kind of a follow-up question to that, uh, do you think that that, that it will be a continuation, the IT spend that will be going towards legacy, uh, specifically in light of a lot of these really aggressive modernization efforts that we're seeing come out of legislation? Um, you know, we can get into CNAP and others. Uh, it's been discussed, I believe, today by some of the earlier keynote speakers. I'm trying to take this more aggressive approach uh, to you know, holistic national cybersecurity defensive capacities around that. So as we're moving uh, from legacy to a modernization efforts, um, how do you see the, the spend associated with that? And what are some of the obstacles that we're gonna have to work both on the private and public side to accomplish those goals? Uh, one obstacle is thinking through the, the right approach to open source. Mm -hmm. And as it's one thing to know that you're going to want to modernize, it's another thing to know how you choose to modernize. Um, so to answer your core question, I see the legacy costs decreasing. I think they're going to begin to pay off that technical debt that we've accrued over quite some time. Your example is very clear in the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, but I think as a federal government, there needs to be a clear vision of where will we move to? Because right now, there's, there's, there's 
to, to your point about cloud first, there was a there's strong movement to open source, then there was a movement away from open source and not a policy to accompany that movement to open source and, and to your point around risk mitigation, risk management, risk aversion. And now they're looking for that policy to take the next step. So, so we would think of it as digital risk management. Mm -hmm. um, what, what uh, you know, in talking about legacy systems, they particularly have been protected by cybersecurity, which is an overlay on those systems. Um, we see two other verticals that have to, have to start to come into the nomenclature. So it isn't just cybersecurity as we know it. Cybersecurity as we know is about $170 billion a year market by 2020 is what we think. Uh, we have two other verticals. The first is enablement. So, so what is happening in our society is more and more things come up that are digital. Um, the most recent that you read about is blockchain. That's a new digital platform that's coming online. As these new digital platforms come on, are they secure as they come on? Um, Internet of Things, mm -hmm. uh, bring your own device, the cloud mm -hmm. are all being created without security in mind. Now in the future, we believe, where the, and where some investing will go, the next three to five years, those will have embedded inside of them the security that they need to be protective. Uh, whether it works or not, I don't know yet, but at least that's one area that we're looking at. So as you enable digital platforms, your vulnerabilities increase and you want to be able to have security. The second area is, is, uh, is monitoring and management. Um, monitoring and management would suggest that before you get to the question of security, you need to do the analysis that says, what are your assets? The second thing you need to do is to figure out where do they sit. I mean, we go in many times and sit down with uh, companies to do some kind of an assessment, and they don't know what their assets are. You get 50 people inside of a company of 1,000 people, and they don't know where they are. Um, they don't even know where they sit, and they're shocked to find out that they sit on a network that 50,000 people have access to. And then finally, what are, of, of those assets, where, where is the, the things you really need to protect? And then you get to the question of security. But people don't do that kind of analysis. They need to do that. And then the third area is, is cybersecurity. So I think as you're looking at, at, at enablement, you're looking at what are the, what are the potential blockades I think as you open up your thinking on cyber, and not just think of cybersecurity, but think of cyber, you've got to think of enablement, monitoring, and, and uh, management, and then, and then, and then cybersecurity. That, 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 by the way, is a $3 trillion a year market compared to a $170 billion a year market. So as you look at those things, it's just getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the biggest barrier, I think, is, is, is in the, on, the, on the commercial side, especially as, as technologies come out of the government, is ease of use, um, whether it's, whether it's uh, um, less costly. I mean, some of the things that you would expect. We see encryption technologies all the time. Uh, we saw one encryption technology that was stunningly good. I mean, really, really very good. But there's only one customer for it who's willing to pay a million dollars because they can't explain into the commercial side how to use it. Benefit, yeah. And so, so, so you've got those issues, uh, and that one customer would only pay a million dollars, well, we wouldn't invest in that, even though it's probably the best encryption technology you know, around, um, yeah, and you see that. The translation of that is difficult, I think, sometimes, which gets into another question I had earlier when we were talking about the public private uh, acquisition cycles from the different sectors. And um, where do you, you know, the government is regularly requesting commercialization of cyber technology specifically uh, and to fit their needs. You know, this whole GOTS or government um, developed technology to COTS, commercially off the shelf technology. Um, how does this trend impact either negatively um, or positively the alignment between the public and the private sector um, acquisition strategies and, and where do you see that going? I mean, it, it's sort of a sad tale in many ways. You, you see technologies that come out of some really great research that DHS sponsors and that DARPA sponsors, and it can't go back yeah, into the That's federal it. government, right? InQtel is another example. So it's got to go out, it's got to have commercial success, it's got to get acquired, and then it can get sold back to the federal government when DARPA was trying to act on an immediate requirement or need that they'd identified 
within the federal government, and yet they're on a five-year cycle in order to take a technology from development to a point at which a federal agency can acquire it. So it's a massive problem that nobody seems to have solved. Any additional comments from the other panelists on that? Mike? Um, you know, where, where, where the, government, the government and the private companies, um, uh, what does the government want to be able to do? The government wants to be able to provide information to the private companies so that they can protect the critical infrastructure that they own. The problem is, is the government wants in return data from the private companies. The private companies don't want to give the government data, so you've got to stand off. All right? Yet, the private companies would love to have the data that the government gathers um, even more efficiently, I think, than, other, than, than in the private sector. Um, we see platforms being created um, that will allow an interchange of that data mm -hmm. um, anonymously so that, that, that no one knows where it's really coming from, and then delivering some potential solution sets to the private companies so that they can put up their defenses. Uh, we see that kind of investing, a platform kind of investing that's coming uh, that will allow that exchange without the companies having to worry about the government getting some, some information and, and without the government worrying about whether the company's going to misuse the information that they provide. Right. So and we that, see that kind of public-private partnerships right, beginning to develop. And that exchange right. doesn't always need to be two ways. So we're a commercial service provider and enhanced cybersecurity services yeah. through Department yeah, of Homeland Security. <laughs> and that's a program where classified indicators are being used to secure critical infrastructure and commercial entities through sanctioned providers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an example of not needing, the government not demanding or asking for the commercial input, but pushing out the classified indicators for use. And as a yeah. uh, provider of the ECS program, do you see that public-private partnership and how the government's provided that information to Lockheed Martin to then, in turn, sell that capability to your downstream customers? Has that benefited? Has it been a successful program from your perspective? And that the ability to provide that continued growth service downstream, um, you know, not having to have these specific details associated with, you know, where the attribution of that indicator came from, but the protection mechanisms, you know, uh, the actionable data per se. Absolutely, and then. It it allows critical infrastructure and commercial entities to then ask for more solutions that are going to help secure their enterprise. And in many ways, it's the tip of the iceberg of thinking about classified data sets that are useful. Mm -hmm. But as you know, and the jobs you've had, that's one piece of it. And now it's what are you going to do when there's a hit? What are you going to do on and all the, the times when there's not a hit? The unknown unknowns, et cetera. What so actions it gets, are you going to take associated with that alert? Correct. Which is the downturn or the um, upside sale associated with it or the uh, protectional, uh, additional protection mechanisms that you can provide your entities, protected entities. Correct. And I think that alerting point, Michael was hitting on some concepts earlier around the, the security security part, once you get to the security part after inventory assets, et cetera, and when looking at companies to invest, I think it's key to figure out how is that product being used. A lot of surveys, 90% of tools purchased uh, were quickly discontinued either before deployment or after deployment. And so it's not, one, it's not enough to say we're installed in X enterprise. Are they using it? Are they getting alerts for it? Are they getting so many alerts they are ignoring those alerts? Yeah, the noise. Can you Correct. ensure that your capability is uh, bringing down the noise and not increasing that volume associated with alerts? Is it actionable data associated yes. with that? Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Enhanced Cybersecurity Program, it is a program that came out of the defense industrial base um, maybe five or six years ago was transitioned to DHS, and it's an ability for government to provide uh, classified indicators uh, to private industry um, through uh, entities like Lockheed Martin and other ISPs or managed security services that can then um, ensure that that information, the classified aspect of it is protected in a SCIF, but the actionable data is protecting downstream critical infrastructure partners. Without needing clearances right. or your own facility that can uh, absorb that information. Correct. Well, that's great. Did you have a comment? Sorry, I didn't know if you, okay, sorry. Uh, I thought we'd go back to CNAP. We talked about it just briefly when I was talking about the aggressive measures that we're seeing come out of um, Congress lately and from the White House. I wanted to get your perspective on um, CNAP and other legislation uh, that we're seeing. I think there's a methodology change that's uh, on the precipice uh, to happen in the cybersecurity landscape because of legislation mm -hmm. like CNAP and other executive orders similar in that space. Um, I wanted to get the perspective of the panel on um, how you see 
those, uh, those methodologies changing from what we've seen in previous legislation in the past um, that would have been considered maybe similar? Um, is it going to be able to provide that more, you know, the holy grail of agile acquisition, um, those processes that need to be put in place for quicker development, quicker adoption? Um, I wanted to get the perspective of the panel since you all have some unique backgrounds in this. And, and, and Rob, if you want to start us on that, that would be great. Sure. So. After the OPM hack, there was this sort of panic in government. Oh my God, we've got to do something about cybersecurity. And so there was a program called the Cyber Sprint. And it was basically in 30 days, do whatever you can do to improve cybersecurity. And so they focused on cyber hygiene, right? Going around and patching vulnerabilities in known systems. And then essentially, I think people realized, okay, that's great, but we've got adversaries inside our network. There's no point in locking the door after they've come in we've got to get them out. And so in October, you had something that was called the CSIP, the Cybersecurity Implementation Plan. And that was really focused on like, let's find the adversaries inside the network and let's get them out. And then the third evolution, and this all happened in six months, which is pretty impressive mm -hmm. for a federal evolution of policy. They had a very big incentive to do that. <laughs> <laughs> was the, uh, was okay. the Cyber National Action Plan, which came out, I think, in January, February. Mm -hmm. And it really was premised on the, okay, you know, we can patch known vulnerabilities. We can chase the intruders out of our networks, but we're never going to have security until we can move away. I'm going to steal a line from Phil Venables. Until we can move away from purchasing security products to purchasing secure IT products. And so the big focus was on IT modernization in the CNAP. It was the idea of needing billions of dollars, 3.1 in this year's budget request to upgrade legacy IT systems so we had defensible architectures. So I think that actually shows pretty rapid evolution in thinking. The problem is right now we don't just need the thinking, we actually need Congress to come through with a big pot of money this year. And I think the estimate from the federal CIO was it's really more like a 16 to $20 billion hole over the next five years. So it's really going to be up to Congress whether they're going to open up the purse strings and actually let the next administration effectively implement this strategy. Um, any additional comments from the other panelists on that? I'm sorry? Oh, any additional comments? I think, he's, I think he's got the point. I think he's right on it. Yeah, uh, you kind of opened up my last question, but I'll save that. I have one more before we get to that question, uh, Rob. Uh, for the, based on recent cyber breaches, kind of getting to things that we've seen from OPM um, to things that have happened in critical infrastructure, um, a lot of the healthcare breaches that we've seen, um, there's this perceived looming rise of, uh, to incredible levels of potential regulation, while at the same time, it seems that there's a bipartisan um, agreement uh, in the House of Representatives as well as Senate uh, that, there, that you know, regulation is not the answer. Um, I wanted to, to get the panelists' perspective on that. What do you think are the options? And um, if there was to be regulation, who, uh, which federal department agency would be the best uh, position to regulate uh, this kind of thing? I'm going to look at Mike. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. <laughs> Greg? Uh, I mean, regulation's the third rail in cybersecurity policy in Washington. And in 2011, the Obama administration stepped on it and put out a uh, regulatory proposal to Congress, which I, I think Mike referenced the fact that the Chamber of Commerce just killed it and killed it dead and claims credit for it. Uh, and so you had this sort of standoff across Lafayette Square Park between the White House and the Chamber of Commerce. And the Chamber won. And since then, we've just been talking about cybersecurity information sharing and finally got a bill on that pass. So I, I think it's something that everybody is afraid to touch. And I, I think the fundamental problem with regulation, and I think Tom was getting to this point earlier on the last panel, was we don't necessarily know if you were to set regulations, if you could stipulate that market failure exists, what you would require. What would those regulations say and what would companies have to do and what's effective? And I think a lot of the independent regulators, particularly in the financial industry, are struggling with that. They may come up with answers that other sectors adopt, but right now I don't think anybody wants to talk about regulation. 
Yes, I'll add, as a heads down practitioner more, I, yeah, I tend to turn away from regulation and focus on people want to secure their data, people want to keep their jobs, the incidences and the breaches, the, the reaction has been very positive because I think it's gotten people's attention and focus. And uh, commercial entities have to decide, is this an existential threat to my being, so I'm going to invest one way, is this not necessarily existential, but it's, it, it's a risk that I need to mitigate and manage. Perhaps I need to outsource more of this. We, we don't outs we outsource uh, physical security guards and our locksmiths and everything else, but yet everyone's building out security operations centers, you have 30 people deep or more. And so you figure out where you are in that continuum and secure yourself appropriately. I think those are just good fundamental business decisions and risk management mm -hmm. that exist irrespective of regulation. So, so I think the... Uh, um, uh, you, you're going to you're going to you, you're going to see a lot of it uh, not happen in the government. I, th I don't think they're going to pass it. Um, they're going to try to pass it. They will when there's a major takedown of a company or take takedown of a of a part of critical infrastructure. You'll then see a rush to pass something mm -hmm. um, like Dodd Frank. You remember those days. Um, uh, uh, but where you're going to see the practices really come into fore is on, again, in the commercial companies. Um, they have got to survive. That's the word, survive. We had a, and, and this just kind of shows you kind of what took place, we had a nation state attack the United States of America on its own soil, nearly take down one of its companies, companies not yet totally up and going, um, and what was our response? Sanctions. So think about these things. Now, now there were some classified responses, I believe. I'm not cleared, so I don't know about that, but my guess would be there were. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be the private companies that are going to lead the way, I believe, in the kinds of things that have to be put into place, because it is a question of survival. I mean, I mean if you don't think it is, then you, don't, you should just turn around and walk right out of here, because, because the, you can be taken down. You can be infiltrated. You can you can you can lose all of your information. Um, I mean, how many of you do mergers and acquisitions? How many of you have um, a cybersecurity due diligence checklist? I can tell you, we've talked to the three largest acquirers of companies in America. Okay, I only know of one that's got it. There's the other two that don't. And they kind of sit there and they kind of look at you and kind of wonder what's going on. Not to mention the fact that after you acquire those companies, you, you end up, you end up uh, with having to spend tens of millions of dollars to try to protect what you've just bought. I mean, it's a, it's a never ending kind of thing. So I think, I, I think the, the leadership is not going to be regulation. I think you're going to see it in some places. Yeah. In some critical areas of infrastructure, you already have it. You also have it, for example, the Department of Defense um, uh, um, eighty-five percent. I think I'm right on this. You know, eighty eighty percent of the electricity, critical infrastructure that's provided to the Department of Defense, is controlled by fifteen private companies. Hmm. Okay, what the Department of Defense has said, without regulation and without any other things that you that you think you need, Department of Defense has said, if you are going to provide electricity to the Department of Defense, you must have defense-grade cybersecurity protections. And, 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 if, and if you're not, if you don't have that, don't bother to compete to provide that. So you're going to see. Yeah, the regulations moving into the acquisition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I, I see that as well. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with FDIC. They recently put out a similar kind of, you know, regulatory compliance for um, cybersecurity uh, within their acquisition cycle as well. If you want to, um, you know, provide a service to them, you have to have an audited, accredited yeah. product before it can be allowed in there, and it has to be done by an objective third party. You can't just uh, certify no, yourself. Certainly. And so I think you're going to see continuation of that kind of adoption for product introduction. Um, it won't be regulated from a regulatory body, but it'll be done kind of in a cottage industry type approach um, where there'll be you know, more of these third party auditor firms, um, blue canopy types that will come out and do that kind of work. I definitely see that as, a, as an evolution because I, I agree with, with Rob that there's not a whole lot of um, 
uh, acceptance uh, for regulation uh, across this administration, uh, which gets me into my next question. So it is 2016, the year of uh, campaigns, the Uber, Uber, Uber campaigns, um, with the two you know, proposed candidates at this point in time, we'll just look at the two leads. Uh, what kinds of things do you, would you see changing um, you know, in a, a Hillary White House or a Trump White House for the cybersecurity landscape, um, specifically when it comes to the spend and demand of cybersecurity and uh, the acquisition process. Um, I'd love to hear from the panelists uh, um, things that you would, you know, you get out your crystal ball and you can uh, give us your, you know, forecast for what you see the landscape looking like, um, you know, po January, what is it, 19th, 2017. So. Well, so I'll give you a complete disclosure here. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a, I'm, I was a former executive director myself. of the Democratic <laughs> National Committee, so, so that'll tell you kind of where I'm going on this. Um, uh, what I do know on one campaign, I'm not sure about the other campaign, is that when Hillary talks about national security, she talks about the four pillars of national security that you'd be familiar with, Europe, and the Russians, how do you take care of the Russians? She talks about ISIS, she talks about the Middle East, and she talks about Asia. And, and, and that discussion is pretty much what you would expect it to be. She has gotten up and she has elevated two other verticals into the highest levels of national security. First is climate change, and the second is cybersecurity. So the expectation is, I think, in that administration, if, if she was fortunate enough to win, is, to, is, is that that will be at the highest levels of the government and will be a high priority. Um, and, and I just happen to know that, you know, uh, but, but uh, and, I, and I'm not sure what, uh, well, what Donald Trump like has in mind. Yes, yes. Uh, Rob, do you have a perspective on that? Uh, sh sure, I mean, let me talk about the other side of the equation. I, I actually think only two candidates put out anything on cybersecurity, any kind of plans. One was Jeb Bush, one was Ben Carson, and I, I can sum them both up as essentially saying, speaking to the bipartisan nature of cyber in Washington right now, keep doing what the Obama administration did, and then they just added in snipes about Hillary's email server, and that was their whole plan. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, <laughs> but it at least speaks to a lack of new ideas and new direction coming out of the political process on cybersecurity. I don't know if we're surprised by that. Yeah, I think it's a, the last held out for a bipartisan issue, but yes, Greg, did you have any specific? Uh, I just agree that whether you're negotiating trade deals, whether you're protecting and growing American GDP, I mean, we, we all live this all day long. It touches every single facet, even SF 86s, you know, an OPM, and, and you pick it. Very it, familiar with those. Right. It <laughs> certainly matters on all facets, and so I see it as bipartisan also. Okay. And no significant changes come January of 2017. That's great. Um, so, with that, I will open it up to your questions on the floor. I see um, um, the uh, lady on the left. Uh, this question is about uh, the commercialization of government funded RD. Uh, I've learned over the years that the DOD sort of uh, liberally slaps ITAR restrictions on uh, technology that they're funding. And this has a, it creates a real barrier to a, a small business, for example, uh, commercializing the results. Uh, does a group like Paladin or other um, uh, organizations that invest in these technologies, do you assist in lifting ITAR restrictions if the technology looks like it's very promising? Yes, so, so you've raised a couple of issues. Um, from an investment standpoint, what, what the young lady has spoken to is the government is spending billions and billions of dollars in, in, uh, in cybersecurity research and development. We track that um, into the national labs. We track that into the, into the universities. Um, and if we take a technology out of there, think of the money that the government spends as non-dilutive financing. Now, who, do, who wouldn't want non-dilutive financing in their company? Okay, so they're spending an enormous amount of money. We had one company that we took out which had, which had $40, $40 million of federal money spent to, to prove the technology, really a stunning technology in the health vertical, actually. Um, and. Um, uh, in, in the normal course of things, your pre-money would have been 50, 60 million dollars. We got that for two million pre. So that's a good place to hunt for transactions and deals. The second question is yes. 
when we start to look at the technologies, we take a look at uh, ITAR, we take a look at a whole series of government issues around it. One of the things that we become concerned about is if the, if, you know, will the government grab it, take it into the black world, and you never see it again? I mean, that's, a, that's an issue in some, in, in, in some places. Sometimes the government will take it and enter into a joint research and development piece, which is very helpful. Um, we, we have created companies to help the, our portfolio companies find markets globally. So we look at this up front um, and help companies avoid that problem or work through it. Yet you have to because cyber is global. And so the solutions have to be adopted globally. And, and that's one of the reasons why we established an office in London is be able to, to be able to do that, take, take our technologies into Europe and into, uh, and into the MENA region as well. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, and um, gentlemen here in the front. Yeah, quick one. Uh, do you envision uh, that our government will allow the private sector, uh, through authorization, of course, to attack back these hostile networks <laughs> and servers? That's a good one for you. <laughs> I, I mean, not in the future, as well as. Uh, the far well, outlook. Yeah, do you no, want not only no, but hell no. I mean, yeah. I, I would say that if you look at the position that the Department of Defense has taken, uh, they've said this is what we do, and we only do it under a presidential authorization. I can't amend or imagine a circumstance under which we shift to a position where anybody can do that without that level of scrutiny, right? We don't want private companies starting wars for the United States. That's in nobody's interest. Right, and, and I think you have to look at the proportionality associated with the activity. So if you look at the financial institution DDoS activities that occurred in 2013, there were a lot of banks that were specifically asking DHS, FBI, NSA to hack back. What happens when you hack back is you're no longer having a proportional uh, response associated with that. Um, you are you know, essentially um, you know, breaking into, if it was a physical location, a physical, you know, a network, uh, a network which would be the equivalent of a physical location. Um, and then there's the aspect of, you know, they could do something even more retaliatory associated with maybe um, unknown implants that they have across different networks. I mean, you know, the Sony example is, is a perfect example of how that can escalate um, to something very destructive. So the U.S. government's response from when I was there and, and Rob as well is, um, yes, exactly that. Uh, no, it's not a, and, and actually FBI specifically said, as law enforcement, we will come after you if you were to do that, because now you've just made yourself the bad guy. <clears throat> Any other questions? I'm sorry? I turn the other cheek. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that? The hack back? It violates the law. I mean, I mean, just today it violates the law, and they ain't going to change that law. The chaos mm -hmm. that that would cause would be unbelievable. I mean, the, the other point, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, please. I mean, the other point, it also violates our treaty obligations. But beyond that, you know, there's always this desire to hit back. The effectiveness of that is really in question in my mind. The way that attackers work, right, they're bumping from hot point to hot point to hot point. They're not attacking you from their own infrastructure. They're yeah. attacking you from your grandmother's computer. Yeah, you could go after a, a, an intended target, um, an innocent victim that has also you know, been uh, compromised, which is you know, a lot of things that happened with the robot um, botnet that was created to go after the banks. It was uh, you know, vulnerable code across NetBlock owners' um, you know, websites that were the ones that were actually attacking the banks. Um, they were victims as well. And so you also have to be careful with where you're pointing that gun. Because um, you could be potentially, um, you know, shooting the wrong, uh, wrong entity yep. associated with that. You know, to give you, to give you, to give you comfort, there's no greater offensive cyber capability than what the United States has. It's awesome. So as much as we sit here and we talk about what, you know, what what the issues are and how difficult it is and how companies can't do it, what they do at, at the NSA and the U.S. Cyber Command is unbelievable. And their abilities are unbelievable. They have to be very careful, though. I think what Ann just said, the, the law of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to take down the, the electrical grid in Syria uh, because everything's interconnected, will that inadvertently take down the electrical grid in France? I'm, 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 being, yeah. being, being, uh, I'm overstating it to make the point. So they've been very, been, been very careful. But the awesome capacity that the 
U.S. Cyber Command, NSA, um, each one of the services have is, is really um, second to none, second to none. If you really just want a, a really fun thought experiment here, in the, in the case that Ann was talking about, most of the servers that were attacking the banks were located in the United States, mm -hmm. and most of those were in Texas. <laughs> so can you imagine what would happen if Cyber Command launched a cyber attack against the Lone Star Republic of Texas? <laughs> it's a really interesting problem. The ability, yeah. yeah come on it's TV with beautiful commercials. Right. Amazing, doo -doo -doo. right. But it's and actually. But a lot of that has to do with the SLAs associated with those NetBlock owners. Um, so when they use something like Joomla or WordPress uh, to spin up these you know, thousands of sites a day, they're using sometimes older versions of those products. And those, uh, the ability to seamlessly get them to a clean version that's no longer susceptible for that PHP you know, script that would you know, create a zombie, it breaks those SLAs. And so you know, it wasn't really in the best interest uh, for them to fix that because it wasn't impacting their business. So I know law enforcement and uh, government had a lot of discussions with the ISPs to try to make that you know, part of their a business case for them. And then we even went to you know, work with Joomla, work with WordPress. How can you create a, a scalable, seamless uh, migration from one vulnerable version to a non-vulnerable version without breaking the underlying infrastructure associated with that? I think Heartbleed had a lot to do with changing how we look at upgrading our infrastructure so that it is done in such a way that you're considering the third parties associated with that, um, which gets into you know, the whole idea of looking at not just my stack, but all the third parties associated with that and the, the potential vulnerabilities that they're introducing into my services. Stay fast, just in the back to wrap oh, it up. Sorry, so okay. with that, uh, we will, uh, any additional comments? Or Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciated this panel and the discussion. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well.